There are over 35,000 museums within the United States, welcoming over 850 million visitors each year. Did you ever wonder what goes on behind the scenes in museums, creating the displays and exhibits we all enjoy? Join us as we explore museums and their exhibits from the inside out. Tennis, anyone? Grab your racket, because we're in Newport, Rhode Island at the International Tennis Hall of Fame Museum. It's earned the prestigious Smithsonian Institution affiliation and is also a National Historical Landmark. It first opened its doors as the Newport Casino in the summer of 1880. Despite the name, it never was a gambling facility, but it was the place to be for Newport's elites at the turn of the century. In 1881, the first National Men's Singles Championship took place right here. Although the museum is rooted in tennis history, it's brimming with state-of-the-art, interactive, multimedia exhibits. You can call the shots by recording your own play-by-play -play for a real broadcasting experience, or get tips from 20-time Grand Slam winner Roger Federer in the Holographic Theater. You can even keep tabs on the global tennis community via a five-foot interactive globe that shows tennis events, recent results, and live scores with the touch of a finger. Today we'll talk to tennis great and current CEO of the International Tennis Hall of Fame, Todd Martin. Todd's an amazing ambassador for tennis, and we'll get his unique perspective on the sport. Then we'll take a peek behind the scenes at some of the fascinating artifacts in the museum's collection that are not on view for the public. So are you ready to learn more about the exciting world of tennis? Let the games begin. So Doug, you've got to tell me about this fantastic building. So the Newport Casino, where we're housed, the museum is housed, was built in 1880. It was uh, built by James Gordon Bennett Jr., who oversaw the New York Herald Tribune in the 1870s, and he was a summer resident of Newport, and he lived across the street, and he was looking for a place to house, you know, recreation and a club, and so he purchased the land and he hired the, the company. And then in the summer of 1880, this opened. This property really predates the mansions and the rest of Newport. So this was the primary place for social recreation at the time. And a year later, in 1881, the United States National Lawn Tennis Association was looking for a place for its first championship. And they hosted it here on our front lawn courts. So American tournament tennis began here. We hosted that tournament until 1914, okay. and then it moved to Forest Hills. Wow. Well, let's talk about grass courts. Sure. Um, there's got to be a big difference in playing on a hard surface and, and grass courts, but did that start because it was just simpler to have grass and play on grass? Yeah, I mean, you know, the game spread with box sets. So you could purchase a box set and they'd set it up on lawns, and that's how they played. And it was, you know, they weren't thinking about hard courts at that time. So. The circuits in the United States were largely grass courts. Hmm. So it would all sort of lead up to Forest Hills at the time, you know, and had the, the U.S. Nationals, and it was all grass. And we've continued to stay grass. So it's, it's unique, not just for, you know, a lot of our players, but really mm -hmm. for during the summer season, anybody can come on our grounds and play on our grass courts for you know, and that's a treat that's for them great. because most people sure. have played on clay or hard court, right. but they haven't played on grass. Well, I know that there is um, interest, obviously, sure. globally in tennis, mm -hmm. yeah. and I know that you've got a lot of technology here in the museum, which is really exciting. Tell me about that globe that I saw. Sure. Early. It's a globe projection system, which is meant to sort of allow visitors to see what was what is happening on any given day in tennis around the world. But we also have a five-foot trivia touch table, which allows people to... Yeah, I'm a little nervous about trying that one. <laughs> which is, allows visitors to sort of play a simulated tennis game against either the computer or themselves and learn, a, learn about you know, the culture of tennis through a series of questions. We also have a Roger Federer hologram, 
which is really popular. It is so realistic. It's it unbelievable. Is. Yeah, it's great. So it's a six and a half minute presentation, and Roger sort of explains his top ten reasons for loving the game of tennis. Reason number one, you get to hit the tennis ball. You get to hit it hard, with pace and rhythm. You can be creative. It's such a great stress for you. So even if you can't do this, that's a gem from the genius Roger Federer. Or this, that's a dream that guides the line. Or even this. The absolute dreams of Roger Federer on the screen again. At some point, he's probably hit a perfect forehand, blasted an ace down the tee, or punched a winning bully into the open court. So let's talk about the art collection. Sure. I see a couple great posters behind you, but I'm sure, sure that's not everything. Sure. So we do. For, for a sports museum, we have a, a nice, small collection uh, of art. We have some, uh, we have an Andy Warhol of Chris Everett. My goodness. We have an Al Hirschfeld. We have George Bellows, who was part of the Ashcan School yeah. in the 20s. New York, and yeah. New York. He's mainly known for his boxing but he also was a resident in Middletown, which is the town next door to Newport in the 20s. And he painted uh, four paintings of tennis at the Newport Casino oh. in, the in 1919 and 1920. And we have some of the lithographs. We also have Child Hassam, and we have uh, a Penfield, and we have some international artists. So it's broad. It's, um, and it's probably more than people would expect to find in a sports museum. I figured there'd be fashion, but so, there's more fashion here than I thought. Let's talk about how that sure. has changed, and maybe sure. we can end with the Williams sisters. <laughs> yeah. So um, tennis was played, you know, women would play it in, in full outfits, you know, in boots and, yeah. you know, dresses and corsets and everything. So, so comfortable. So early, <laughs> early in our experience here, you can see some of those early outfits, and then it's sort of transitions obviously all the way up to the Williams sisters. So there's, you know, Maureen Connolly's poodle dress from the 50s. <laughs> there's Renee Lacoste's uh, crocodile blazer. There is Ted Tinling's outfits for the women on the Virginia Slims tours in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Oh, I remember those. So we have yeah. Billie Jean King and Rosie Casals, and we have an outfit that um, Tracy Austin's mom made for her when she was on tour. Aww. And then we have, you know, the Williams sisters. And we have a cat suit, and we have a tutu outfit that she wore at the U.S. Open. Oh, we have I remember the big Sher controversy it about was. that, wasn't it? We there? have yeah. uh, Maria Sharapova. So we try to get from, you know, current players to mm -hmm. show the sort of the the, the evolution of, yeah. and breadth of women's fashion. And fashion is our most popular topic with really? our visitors. Okay. It is. So, um, men and women? Men, yeah, mostly women, but yeah. men as well. But even the men's yeah. clothing has, has changed, changed a lot. It used to be just white, right? And, and pants. Yes. And then it transitioned to yeah. shorts, and yeah. now it's, yes. I remember seeing Yvonne Lendl play years ago and yeah. seeing pattern, you know, yeah. and thinking, whoa, that, yeah. it seems so shocking. Right. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, we have uh, Borg's classic Fila outfit. Oh, yeah. We have uh, items from Roger Federer when he's won Wimbledon, so we can juxtapose the two of those. So fashion continues to be hugely popular. So here we are in the climate-controlled, one of the climate-controlled archival areas. Tell me where we are. So uh, we have a number of vaults for our collection. As we mentioned, we've got an extensive collection. And this one houses uh, our racket collection, okay. primarily. We've got about 1,200 rackets that span from the early earliest times to today. And the racket I'm holding is from circa 1890. Wow. It's a wood racket. It's got uh, a smaller head than you would normally see today. It has uh, natural gut strings, and the handle is grooved a little bit. Now, is that for rack. better grip? Because there was, was no tape or anything correct. at that point. So they okay. would have just played uh, with no grip on this. So we, we have... Uh, an extensive collection of rackets. As you can tell by the racket you're holding, you know, the head is larger, it's lighter material. Yeah. It obviously feels a lot lighter than the one I'm holding. Uh, the string is different, uh, the head size is bigger. You know, it's, it's a very different game. Mm -hmm. uh, so we obviously document technology and how the evolution of rackets, as an example, have affected the play. So we collect rackets that show the different types of rackets and change in technology related to rackets, or 
we document the rackets used by Hall of Famers oh, I see. to yeah. win a historic match or a milestone in their career. So we have this uh, huge collection, as we discussed, but you know, how do we take this collection to the masses? Not everybody can visit Newport, uh, so we have begun a project, we started two years ago, to digitize our entire collection. Oh boy. And it is a, it is a long process, um, so we are either photographing or scanning every object in our collection, and we're tagging them and then making them available on our website. Mm -hmm. So Todd, you're not on the courts at this point, but you're in the stomping grounds here. Yeah. This must feel right at home. Uh, I never thought I'd feel home at a museum. Yeah. Uh, that was not my background for sure. My sister wakes up all the time uh, jealous that I get to work in a museum because she was a history major in, in college. Uh, but I, you know, as, as important as the museum is, this is a, a living museum. It, it, the whole property at, at the International Tennis Hall of Fame is what I love. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, it's, I've, I've loved the sport since I was four years old, and to be able to live within it and work within it is um, a joy for me. Well, and you're part of its history. A very small, well, I'm very large, but a very small <laughs> part of the history. I want to get your, your spin on the equipment. Yeah. I mean, I've seen it through the years. I mean, I hate to admit I played with a wooden racket and really didn't want to give it up. Technology is a, is a critical element of our sport. And mm -hmm. at, at times, probably, technology has gotten a little bit ahead of us. Um, really? But, but typically, the athletes are really good at catching up to the technology. So when you're playing now, I mean, I'm assuming you play now. Do you play now? Uh, ideally, <laughs> with a, ideally with a wood racket. Yeah, uh, really? Yeah, I, I much prefer playing with a wood racket. And I also play uh, court tennis. So you should make sure to visit the court tennis court that we have here, which is the grandfather of all sports. So I want to talk about your, your career. When you started, you, were, you said you were playing as a child. When did you get bitten by that bug that you thought, okay, this is something I want to seriously do? Was it at Northwestern yeah. or before oh, I, that? Well, well before I was in college, I, I was bit by every sport. Mm. I just yeah, I bet. Um, <laughs> my parents exposed me to everything. Yeah, those basketball I, coaches. Well, I'm sure that were was after my you. that was yeah. my first love, and I okay. still I still enjoy it. I still enjoy playing every sport. Give me a ball, and I'm, Good for you. I'm, I'll be happy. Um, <laughs> The, but the, the thing about tennis, what really grabbed me, I, by the time I was 10, I was probably down to basketball and tennis. Okay. Um, but the thing that grabbed me was the uh, self-responsibility of the sport. Um, some of the skills I was, um, came naturally to me, but mm -hmm. the, the, the way I just so happened to be wired at that, at that age uh, made sense. Mm -hmm. um, having a bit of solitude, um, but also being challenged to be um, my own official, my own, um, uh, you know, responsible for every single element of what was going on on the court. I had yeah. to think for myself, I had to coach myself during, during match, uh, I had to deal and resolve issues with competitors if they felt like I gave them a bad call or vice versa. Um, all of that felt really healthy and fun, and I was a relatively timid guy. And so having that, that independence really was, uh, uh, I, think I, I think I, without knowing it, I think I really understood um, subconsciously mm -hmm. the benefit it was having on my life. So what would you tell a 14, 15, 16-year-old? if they were interested in the sport? I mean, obviously focus, they've really got to be able to concentrate yeah. and have passion, but what do you think is in store for them in the next 10 years of their careers? Well, I think, uh, first, uh, I would hope that a 14-year-old is not thinking of it as a career. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, it, it, playing professional tennis was a dream of mine, 
uh, until it became a reality. And um, you know, eventually it also was probably a goal late in my high school days mm -hmm. and, and during college, but a goal in that you know, someday I hope I can play. I would like to, to not have to go straight from college into the working world. I would mm -hmm. like to be able to play tennis. Nowadays, our kids are ultra-focused on the destination as opposed to embracing that journey along the way. Mm -hmm. So a 14 through 16-year-old, if you're not playing more than one organized sport, I hope you're throwing a ball around. I hope you're roughhousing, wrestling, swimming, you know, whatever. I think athletes need to be active and diverse in their application in order to develop um, both the peace of mind and the yeah. soundness of, uh, of, of thinking that is required when we play in, in sports like tennis, but also uh, we become better athletes by doing more than one thing. Well, a more rounded person. Uh, well, that was Period. certainly my parents' objective. I, you don't yeah, have to talk to my it? wife to see if I've, yeah, if if I've satisfied. How that worked yeah. out for you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so back to the equipment. Everybody knows that we've gone from smaller head rackets to larger head rackets. Are you finding that there it was a difference? Is the sweet spot larger? Can you hit uh, harder serves? I mean, the, the, there is no similarity really? between what used to be and what is now. Wow. Um, the... Uh, the only thing that um, I said I play with wood rackets a lot. Yeah, yeah. The only thing that feels right to me is my backhand. If I hit it right on the strings, like if I hit it right, I said that there is I can make a ball do similar things with those two rackets. Okay. Otherwise, um, the the hitting surface or the sweet spot is exponentially larger than it used to be with uh, graphite rackets mm -hmm. and it's, it's, it's because uh, of the materials and the size of the racket. I mean, we're, we're talking about um, you know, 25 to 30 square inches of, of more space yeah. to make contact with the ball. I, I think every single player on the professional tour uses some sort of polyester string really? which okay. um, uh, creates probably a spin rate that's, um, I don't have the data, but it's probably twice twice of what a uh, what, what a gut string would, mm -hmm. would have would produced, produce, which is yeah. what I played with most of my career. Wow. Now I know there's so many great artifacts in the museum, but I, you must have a favorite or two. Can you share those with us? So I, I have um, one that I cannot give a tour without slamming the brakes on and saying, this is what I need you to look at. Uh, but the, in the 15 minute tour, there's nobody that I don't walk past uh, and, and, and point out a telegram from Jackie Robinson to Arthur Ashe. Basically, on, on the day after uh, Arthur won the first U.S. Open in 1968. And, um, you know, it was a, a mess of a time uh, in our society. Mm -hmm. And here, the, uh, the barrier breaker of baseball sending a sending a telegram uh, a four sentence telegram with without any periods it was really like straight to the spot uh, right to the point uh, and this telegram from from Jackie to Arthur was, was really one of the more profound eloquent and um, just moving touching uh, yeah. you know that a boy uh, message you could possibly imagine and it's so uh, it so transcended sport. It, mm -hmm. it was about it was about society, but also uh, in that element that didn't transcend the sport. It was we are doing good by using our sports and our capabilities in our sports to affect change in our in, in positive change in our society. I want to hear more about the Hall of Fame and how does a player get into the Hall of Fame and how long does that take and. Yeah. What's the process? So it takes a minimum of five years. Five years, uh, okay. Everybody has to be retired for at least five years to okay. be able to be inducted into the Hall of Fame, which is, for, for me, I still believe it's a really good barometer for uh, does this person's career and achievements stand uh, the, the, the test of time. Yeah, really. Through the committee process, we refine and um, 
uh, or distill all these candidates into um, into the into a into a group. It mm -hmm. could be zero. It could be a lot. Uh, but into a group of individuals that are deserving consideration for induction into the Hall of Fame. Deserving to be at least considered amongst the all-time greats uh, in the game. It's, it's become, for me, it's become more exciting over the years because now so many of my peers are, um, oh, yeah. <laughs> are being inducted. And to see, you know, see somebody like Yevgeny Kafelnikov who um, I used to fight tooth and nail with, and was not um, was not maybe the most sensitive or emotional type. <laughs> yeah. Be so excited and wrapped up with the the uh, the honor of being inducted in the Hall of Fame. It's like it's fun for me to actually actually see these guys who used to beat up on me yeah. uh, be moved <laughs> and and um, and value and treasure what this what this moment means for them today, but also yeah. uh, I think why it means so much to them today is they understand that they've earned their own bit of uh, perpetuity here. Most kids know about, about tennis. Maybe they don't get the opportunity to go in and take a lesson or two. So let's say they don't have a facility like this in the area. What would you recommend? I do, and I'm biased, but I do believe that tennis has probably the most unique uh, attributes and challenges that are um, that are presented to children in order to develop into uh, uh, into you know successful yeah. and uh, productive yeah. and responsible uh, older children and and, and adults. Um, our sport is way more accessible than it's ever been. Park courts, you need a racket a wall, a ball, it doesn't even have to be a tennis ball, just get something that bounces. Um, for some of us, the monotony of hitting a ball against a wall um, is really therapeutic. Yeah. It, there's an anger release, there's a, a puzzle solution, uh, solving uh, message in every moment of every, uh, of every day with a tennis racket in your hand. And there's also programs like what we're doing here uh, in so many of the communities across the country. Well, I remember hitting him against the garage door until our neighbors started <laughs> complaining. It was making too much sound. But you get the exercise, too. So My, my parents <laughs> wouldn't let me do the garage door because of the repairs that they felt were going to be necessary. Well, you probably had necessary. a much stronger hit this than was, I did. I was four years old. I don't think I had a very powerful hit. Well, it's um, still probably more powerful But then uh, we had a, a redwood uh, picnic table. Oh, and nice. so they stood the redwood pickup table, picnic, picnic table up on end, and I hit the ball against it. Little did they know that from that journey, yeah. now that here you psychosis are. was going to be developed. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> Over 250 individuals have had the honor of being inducted into the International Tennis Hall of Fame. Their commitment to tennis, raw talent, and sheer determination have transported the sport from the social scene here in Newport so long ago to tennis tournaments around the world. Players from the past like Rod Laver, Chris Everett, Bjorn Borg, and Arthur Ashe inspired a love for the sport in the next generation of players, including Venus and Serena Williams, Roger Federer, Rafa Nadal, and Novak Djokovic. We'll have to stay tuned to see who will follow in their footsteps and perhaps be inducted into the International Hall of Fame themselves. Thanks for joining us on Museum Access, where every visit is an adventure. I'm Leslie Mueller. See you next time. Made possible by TFI Envision, the connection to conversion agency. Palomino Restaurant Group, 25 years of creative cuisine. ML Capital Partners, building the businesses of tomorrow today.